while most of the world and certainly the majority of the American media is focused on the Israeli, uh, now Iranian conflict and all that's going on with that, with the huge missile barrage last night, uh, it's hard to pay attention, but it's also important to remember that there is another war going on, uh, one that we've covered a lot here with Russia and Ukraine. And even though it's off the headlines, a lot of things are still going on. And uh, we thought it was important to kind of break contact from the, the uh, Israeli situation right now. Although that one's probably just in the, the latter stages of waiting for the next explosion. We'll get back to that one in a little while. But first of all, uh, I want to bring you up to date on what's happening on the ground in Russia. It's been a while since I've done that. Uh, and we uh, have the excellent Matthew Ho to help us unpack a lot of this stuff and to try to make some sense out of what we do see there. Uh, and we're both on the tactical and on the uh, strategic and political realm. So uh, first of all, Matt, welcome back to the show. Hey, Danny, thank you for having me back on. Always a pleasure to have you on uh, and get some no no kidding, no nonsense views on things and uh, uh, really dig down into the deeper. I, I want to start off, first of all, with a piece that's in the Washington Post, uh, because it, it's noteworthy in one respect that uh, it's getting public notice that things are not going well for the Ukraine side. And uh, according to the headline there, you see that the East is buckling under improved Russian tactics and superior firepower. Uh, and I think that's more important. I want to show some of the things and kind of get your view on these as a uh, combat veteran yourself uh, as to what you, the development, the evolution that you've seen on the Russian side, uh, whether we have or haven't seen it on the Ukraine side, and then what the implications are uh, going forward. And so the first area I want to look at is uh, probably the most recent uh, significant change, and that is the city of Vuladar in the south uh, southeast um, uh, of, uh, yeah, southeast of Ukraine, uh, that, uh, something that, that, that Russia has been trying for a year and eight months right. to subdue that this, this is probably the, the longest battle that, that we've seen in this entire conflict so far. Uh, and Russia has put enormous amounts of, uh, effort into it. I, I want to say, uh, that they have had five separate, uh, attempts to, to crack this nut and they finally did it. Now I want to pull a map up here and kind of show uh, what's been going on with that. So here's, here's, of course, your, uh, your big map. Wait, wait a minute. I'm, I'm not sure I actually did that right. Where are you at? Are <laughs> you, still, you seeing the map? You got me on the screen, so I don't think you did it right. <laughs> I didn't do it right. All right. Well, I could see it and why couldn't y'all? Oh, okay. So there's a reason for that. Uh, so <laughs> here we go. That's a little bit better. All right. So here's the, the main battlefront we've, we've been seeing for a couple of years now. Uh, Vuladar is down here in the south, and that's that's important for a number of reasons. But uh, I want to zero in here because it's going to really show, uh, you know, kind of why things are going the way they are, uh, and and how the change tactics have come in there. If I can find it on the map, that it's in the it south of, of of Donetsk. Yeah, uh, yeah, correct. yeah. You're not in the south of Ukraine. The south of of, of Donetsk, uh, uh, Oblast, or Pl yeah. Pl it, or okay, or and so so here, so here's this is this is kind of where it is. It's kind of in the 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 southern part of the eastern front. Uh, and I want to show you here. So the the terrain around here was is very very hilly and difficult. Uh, there has been, and I'll zoom in on the city itself here. Uh, there's a, uh, it's basically a citadel, but there's lots yeah. of tall buildings. Uh, and the Ukraine side has just done phenomenal at defending the, the, uh, the uh, city from frontal attack, uh, from some flank attacks that Russia has been doing for a long time. But what they did finally, uh, and you're going to see this in some, I'm going to give you some examples elsewhere here in a minute, but they, they decided to say, Hey, how about instead of hitting our head against a brick wall and just keeping trying to come here and here, which plays all to the strength of the defense. We just bypassed the thing. So they started moving here in the north mm -hmm. and then here in the south and taking all of this, uh, you know, and you can see that they they took some of these things field by field. Some of these little squares. Right. I mean, they were fighting over individual squares of these uh, of this forested area and the, the, the forest belts in between of the farmland, et cetera. And so what they did is methodically moved up here until they they were cutting the lines of the, the road networks in there so that they interdicted and took into fire control the the routes that, uh, that would bring in either resupplies or or personnel and take uh, wounded personnel out, et cetera, so that it became untenable. And then they finally just uh, moved into the round to the back part and surrounded the whole thing. And once they had it surrounded and no one could come in or leave, then it was literally just a matter of time before these guys ran out of ammunition, food, and water. Right. Uh, and apparently, according to CNN, this actually fell yesterday. So I, I just wonder, first of all, Matt, if you can just kind of give me, because uh, I know you know something about this battle here. 
Uh, what does this tell you about what Russia had been doing and what they finally started doing? Well, I, I think the cost to them uh, early in the war uh, in the first year or so, particularly, say, highlighted uh, the, 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 what, about four-month-long battle for Bakhmut? And, and, and Vuladar has been, I mean, after Bakhmut was taken by the Russians in April of 03, if I remember correctly, this was one of the cities that was next. This, I mean, so this is how long we've heard about this location for. And well, what that means then is that becomes a political, uh, it becomes a political objective as much as it's a tactical operational or strategic objective. And so this is maybe why you see, uh, particularly even on the defensive side, the Ukrainians holding on for positions longer than they should. Right. Rather than falling back, preparing positions to fall back to the political significance of these towns, because they are known by the West. People in the United States know this town in Ukraine, like we've heard of so many other towns uh, and we learn new ones. Right. Uh, you know, as the front moves farther west or even during uh, Ukraine's offensive last summer, we learned towns we never heard of. Not even towns. They were hamlets, really. Uh, but the political significance of of of, uh, of the weight that no, that Westerners, people in the US, the Brits, our politicians, our media, knowing the names of these places, what that means then for the Ukrainians is that their, their hands are tied and they're not maybe as flexible in their defense as they should be. Uh, for the Russians, I think what we've seen, uh, the difference is say compared to 18 months ago with Bakhmut, uh, the willingness to commit large number of troops in what essentially are front, frontal assaults uh, uh, as opposed to uh, trying to flank, as you were describing, Danny, flank these positions, flank these these uh, built up areas rather than going right into them. Um, and, and so we, that's the evolution I, I think uh, we would have seen naturally. Um, but I think when you compare uh, how the Ukrainians are tied to these cities, these towns, these villages, every time they lose one, it's a major headline in the, U in, in the West um, as compared to how the Russians have been able to be much more flexible. Um, I mean, and you've even seen it in the way that they operate tactically, uh, the, the way the Russians, I, you, I don't even know what you would call their guys on motorbikes and on ATVs that we see footage yeah. of. You know, I mean, is that that's not even a team. You know, that's two dudes on two bikes. You know, I don't even know what the tactical, you know, the unit uh, symbol for that would be, right? You know, <laughs> right. but uh, uh, so we've seen uh, the Russians willing to adapt and to um, make trade-offs in how they conduct this war, you know, based upon the, the reality uh, as it's presented to them, while the Ukrainians remain tied uh, most to a political uh, a, a narrative of this war that they can't lose, they can't def be defeated, they can't retreat, uh, and that's hurt them in ways that, you know, are 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 are, are growing and growing. You can imagine, you can imagine that this war will be different in the sense that if the Ukrainians had had a much more flexible defensive uh, uh, defense in depth, uh, and they were willing to trade land for eating up the Russians as they came forward. Uh, you could see how this could potentially be a different circumstance. Now, overall, it'd still be the same. You still have this essentially uh, status quo, this type of conflict where neither side can knock each other out, you know, that type of thing. But it would be certainly the Ukrainians would be in a better space if they weren't so tied to this narrative of not being defeated, not losing, uh, in any any of their defeats then becoming major headlines. Yeah. And and of course, I I mean, I think that's that's been a fictitious trade off from the beginning because you know i i don't think that it is going to be a static situation and, and that they even if they had had better tactics that they could have changed the outcome i think that the the attritional nature of the battle and the gross in, uh, advantage that the russians have in manpower and firepower and in industrial capacity is just too big to overcome no matter what the west did or didn't do and and I, one of the reasons why this has been so grievous to me is that the the end is is ordained really from the very beginning and to ignore that and to continue to pretend otherwise like you're talking about in a microcosm on some of these individual battles like Vuladar, like Bakhmut, like Avdivka uh is is the, is the kind of a bigger picture too that they keep getting men blown up and killed and right. there's no possibility of reversing the what we see here right and how many are they sacrificing how many are they giving up 
that could be used later, right? So like Bakhmut, I think, was a great example a year and a half ago where Bakhmut was going to fall eventually. And if you hold out, if you give up Bakhmut in January, okay, what do you get in return in terms of the brigades that you don't have destroyed defending what is essentially going to be a defeat for you? And everyone could see that coming. Uh, everyone except, uh, I think, you know, the, those who are the, the strongest proponents of the war and those who are on uh, Twitter posting Bakhmut, st Bakhmut st stands or whatever they were posting back then. You know, I mean, so you do, you get in this position where what's the smarter thing to do here? And is the smarter thing to do to not commit your troops to a fixed position that will eventually be degraded and wore down, or in the case of Validars, we're seeing, uh, you know, basically flanked, you know, as the Russians have been doing more and more so that now your guys are cut off and best case for them is that they're able to squirt out and escape. And of course, worst case being the opposite. And and now I want to I want to go back to the map here and install because now there's something kind of on a bigger issue uh, that's that's at the the decision that's made by the senior leaders whether that's Zelensky whether that's Sersky whether it was Zeluzhny before etc. And, and that is in the battles that they choose to fight and what their objective is. Now uh, we've been talking a lot about the Kursk offensive uh, and I just want to zero in on that. So, so on this map here, just for everybody's recollection, when you see these red uh, symbols, that, that's a Russian assault or a Russian drone strike, and the blue ones are Ukrainian strikes, uh, et cetera. But uh, that, just try and ignore those. The, the thing I want you to zero in on is that all this red area is where the Russians are. The light red area, like here, that's a recent gain by the Russians. And uh, for our folks who've been watching this from the beginning, this is this is I think one of the more recent anyway egregious uh, strategic errors by the Ukrainian side because they they had this uh, operation which they claimed was to draw Russian forces away from the east to make that easier for them to to fight but you see that this this right here is continues to shrink and Russia continues to make these penetrations in here with the, it appears that they're trying to just drive across the neck of this. Uh, of this bulge here so that they will eventually trap all the people in here. And then instead of having to fight their way, like from the top and destroy everyone, if they move through this area here, they basically cut them off and then will force them either to withdraw or to be destroyed as did happen in Vuladar, by the way, they, they had the same thing where they almost had them surrounded and they had a chance to withdraw and they refused to do it. They, they, and from what I read on the Telegram channels, the Ukrainian leadership refused to give permission for them to withdraw. So now then they lost them all. Uh, and there's a similar situation brewing here. But what yeah. you see, Matt, and this is what I want you to talk about, is that this whole foray continues to just eat up all kinds of equipment, manpower, logistics, everything else, just to maintain this part right here. But but this is they they were a little bit further from this from the about the seventh or eighth day in, and it never went any further. So why do they stay there now? It's it's perplexing, Danny. I mean, I, I think we've talked about this before. Certainly, I see the Kursk operation as a political stunt. Right. It was a political mover. Get our people into Russia, be able to trumpet that around the world. Zelensky is going to go to the United Nations with his victory plan. The Americans and the Brits never going to say, oh, yes, look at those Ukrainians. Look how plucky and, 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 and you know, how, how strong they are. And they're not giving up. And look, they invaded Russia. We have to we have to support them. They've got this victory plan, you know, and, you know, we saw how that played out. And now you've got these these troops that were committed to this demonstration, this stunt, uh, there. And just as you described, they're slowly getting cut off. The Russians are in no hurry to do it because they don't need to be in a hurry. I don't think we've ever in the history, uh, I don't know if, if ever in history we've seen a country re react so nonchalantly to their territory being invaded as yeah. we've seen the Russians here because they knew there was no there was no significance in there. There was no importance in this. Everything yeah. was just, this was all geared for Western headlines. It wasn't meant to accomplish anything operationally or strategically. It couldn't accomplish anything operationally or strategically. So now you've got, I don't know what the current estimate of Ukrainian force is there, but say it's about 10,000 still. Uh, you've got 10,000 of what supposedly your, your, your best, most experienced, well-trained and equipped troops uh, stuck in Russia, uh, just getting bled out, and the Russians are taking their time, slowly isolating them 
and wrapping them up. And then, you know, so why they're not withdrawing now, particularly after the 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 United Nations, the victory plans, Zelensky's uh, signing of artillery shells with Governor Shapiro, since that's all done and over with and failed pretty much, um, why they're not withdrawing their forces. And I think it's just this pigheadedness, this stubbornness, this this political cravenness that we can't, we, it's better to lose are you our men better have our men in this meat grinder than to lose face and you know and i just gotta wonder you know how much longer can that continue on and let me show you again let me run back to the map here to show you what the significance and the ramifications of doing what you just said are so here's your kursk salient now i'm going to come down here and we're again going to see some uh, issues on the uh, the the change of tactics. So uh, this is the this is the Pokrovsk front here, and you can see that they continue to inch closer and closer to the city of Pokrovsk. And by the way, this this blue is basically uh, the the range of artillery. So uh, now then the Russians are close enough to where they can take the entire city and all of the roads and the rail networks coming in and out under fire control. So that means that already. The, the utility of having Pokrovsk because of its its uh, communications and its lateral uh, networks that can uh, support uh, the Ukraine side and all of these other areas on the left and right. Now that's already significantly diminished, even without Russia having had physically taken it. One of the more difficult parts of this uh, has been the town of Slidova. This, this area right here. And, and the, the again, the Ukraine side has done a very, very good job of defending this. And for a while, Russia was trying to just continue to go in here and, and pound into it, as they had done in, in a lot of these areas as they'd moved through here. But the defense stiffened up here. Well, now then they have said, OK, fine, we'll just go around it. So that now then they're starting to move north of it. And you see these recent gains here, these light pink areas represent moves in the last 24 hours. Uh, so now then they're trying to move in the southern part of the city and around it to, again, cut it off. And they're going to be faced with the to this uh, this pocket to where they're not going to be able to sustain the troops that they have in there. And again, they'll either have to lose them all like they did in Buladar or pull them out. And if that sounds familiar, uh, this is what we've been showing for uh, the past several weeks, actually. This, this pocket here, which continues to slowly shut, and the Ukraine side has already lost all this. It was actually back here when we first started talking about it. Uh, and many of them now actually have withdrawn from here. But I, in light, Matt, of all the stuff, the troops that they had in the that have were diverted to the Kursk section, just imagine if they had those to reinforce right. this area of Salidova instead of right. having diverted people from these areas to go fight up there. And it's Danny, as we know, it's just not the say, say it's 10,000, 10,000 10, uh, infantry or whatever. It's all the support. Right. So what what commitment of drones, what commitment of intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance assets, what commitment of artillery, what commitment of high Mars and so forth have all been put into that Kursk, you know, that Kursk incursion, as well as too then just all the support, all the logistics, all the trucks and all the fuel tankers and all the the, the right everything that needs to go up there to support yeah. those guys that could have been utilized in the east. Uh, so it's much larger than just uh, what essentially three brigades of troops up there. It, it, it's that as well as to the focus. And so for the, I think they, they went into Russia, what, like around October, August 7th. So for 6th, essentially yeah. six weeks now, the main effort, maybe it's backed off in the last couple of weeks, but say for a month, the main effort of the Ukrainian armed forces was Kursk. That was their main effort. So everything that they had, everything that was in, in, in general support of the Ukrainian army was directed up there and not to the east. And so the guys in the east were, were holding on, it was, things were bad, and then now they start losing all their general support. And, and all the attention is focused on the north. And guess what, guys? You guys are in a guess what? You guys are in a priority right now. Even though there's still a couple hundred thousand Russians pushing on you at a harder and faster rate than you've seen before. You guys are in the priority. So this this Kursk thing was a disaster. I was willing to give it the benefit of the doubt because of the political significance of it. And if Zelensky had gone to New York last week and to D.C. and he had come back with, uh, you know, uh, that we're going to fire storm shadows and attack them into Russia. And we're also going to give you the extended range jazz them. And don't worry, in a few months, we'll talk about tomahawks to you as well. It's, guess what? We're winding up another $75 billion here in the U.S. Congress for you, Voldemir. Then it would have paid off. But it certainly 
did not occur like that. And and and, yeah, and that that was always a fantasy. I think that they could ever have it. Uh, but you know you know where the fantasy doesn't stop on the ground in Ukraine. It doesn't stop even in Kiev. Uh, let's look over to Brussels because we've got now mm. uh, Jen Stoltenberg uh, has has finally uh, passed the torch on to a new boss. Uh, I think his name is Ruta, uh, the new NATO uh, Secretary General. Uh, but, you know, you see the uh, the new NATO boss is a lot like the old one because he's just repeating the same things that uh, Jen Stoltenberg did that, yep, we're going to continue to double down. We're going to support uh, Ukraine. We're going to keep on going down this and ignore reality. So uh, what does that tell you about the NATO alliance? Well, it, it, it shows how you get to be the head of NATO. The way you get to be head of NATO is like Stoltenberg was with Norway and then with uh, Ruta in Holland you be as pro-NATO, uh, you be as pro-American empire, you be more hawkish than any of your counterparts. And then when you leave that prime, uh, the prime minister's office, you can slide into a job at NATO. Uh, I mean, so Ruta comes out of being the PM uh, of, of, of Holland for the last 14 years. Uh, I mean, so, so very important in that sense. Uh, but, you know, certainly his... Uh, uh, we, we can't expect anything different. I mean, just, just as you're saying, Danny, the, 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 the here's the new boss looks like the old boss. Uh, you know, the, I, I don't think there'll be any difference in attitude, any difference in policy. I think if anything, God help us, Ruta will be more aggressive than Stoltenberg was. If people can imagine that, uh, just because he has to prove himself, he has to put his own mark onto NATO. Otherwise he's just uh, Stoltenberg part two. Right. So what is he going to do to make NATO his own? What's what's he going to do to make it in his image? And the only thing you can imagine from this guy is that it's going to be more aggressive. It's going to be more expansionist and it's going to have a much more global desire. So, of course, Russia gives NATO its reasons for existence. Now, a few years ago, there were very good conversations about does NATO have a purpose with particularly after 2022. Uh, those arguments, those conversations have been shut down just because the other side could yell so loud, but Russia, right? So NATO has its purpose because of Russia. Again, no one's questioning that. Many governments in Europe at the expense of their publics are increasing not just their defense spending, but also their commitments to NATO. Stoltenberg is on record of calling for increasing NATO militaries by about 70 brigades, which is massive, which, which talk about fantasy. Wait, 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 wait what did you say? Yeah, about, about two or three months ago, Stoltenberg uh, put out a proposal to increase uh, NATO's uh, combat capacity by about 70 brigades. 70 brigades? 70 brigades. I remember reading this and having to like, <laughs> double check that. Yeah, I mean, so you're, you're talking a couple hundred thousand, right? I mean, and, and where's that? Where are troops. those troops going to come from? Who's going to yeah, pay That's a big fantasy. But that's what he was putting out to now because that's what he wanted his legacy to be. And of course, when you have Russia, why can't you ask for that? Why can't you advocate that? And certainly all, almost all the folks on the television and the newspapers for the most part are going to go along with it. Look at Germany right now. I mean, there is a lot of pushback right now with regards to Germany, in Germany, with regards to the U.S. putting its uh, uh, SM-2 and Tomahawk missiles uh, into Germany, the plan to do that, and then to put the, the uh, next generation uh, cruise missile into Germany as well, you know, a few years down from now, which is a much longer range missile. And, you know, the Germans, the German NATO contingent and the came to the U.S. for the NATO 75th birthday party back in July. And they agreed on a handshake deal with us, with the Americans, without consulting the German public. And there is an uproar now in Germany and some of the success of, of the parties like uh, AFD and, and BSW in, 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 in uh, uh, uh in Germany, that, that that underpins some of it, you know, this anger overall against the Ukraine war, but also overall against Germany's role in NATO and, and as part of the American empire, but not as much as you would think, you know, not, there's not been as much, you know, th this idea of, of we're just going to do whatever we want that the Americans tell us to do, including putting these nuclear armed missiles into our country, which the Russians are going to see as, uh, you know, and, and people old enough to remember what happened when the Persian twos went in. You know, I mean, so, uh, you know, what what will be the mark, though, that Ruta now has to put on NATO? And so, of course, it's going to remain committed to fighting uh, Russia. It, that will be it, its reason for being uh, the reconquest of uh, the Donbass. 
I think is something that certainly is there for a lot of them. How do we, we manage ourselves? How do we rearrange ourselves? How do we get to the point where we're able to take back the Donbass, to take back Valadar, to take back Donetsk, <laughs> exactly. right? Dude, that you can't even slow down statement. the move. What are you talking about take back? I mean, they haven't even slowed down what, the Hey, how many, how many crusades uh, did the Christian nations launch that were just ultimately, oh, right? I mean, there. it's the same mindset. It's the same mindset. But I think, I think now that's even worse, sun. Danny, if I could get you more upset, what I think I'm going to say next is that I think where Ruda will make his mark will be making NATO truly global. And it is already global, as people know. But bringing in Japan, bringing in South Korea, and ensuring that uh, a war with China will not just a U it will not be a U.S. versus China war. It will be a NATO versus China war. I think that's where Ruta will, will make his mark in in, in, in globalizing NATO. It, again, it already is. Ask the Afghan. Yeah, but the good but, thing yeah. about that is that that would that would make China afraid, and they would back down, and then world peace would break out. So yeah, you know, exactly. that's, that's well, yeah, cool. yeah. I, I mean, exactly. I'm sure that's how China yeah. would react, isn't it? I think so. I anyway. think so. And then, of course, the Russian people would see that the Chinese backed down, so they'd be upset that Putin made this alliance with China, and then they'd overthrow Putin. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just a, a, B, and C, Danny. I mean, it's very logical how that would progress. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, well, talk about A, B, and C, and and, and this, especially when you start getting into some money. Um, I, it, it, you touched on this a second ago, but to, to set up this next section here. Uh, so Volodymyr Zelensky comes to Washington, D.C. in July for the 75th NATO birthday party. And he's coming in with a lot of high expectations and, and a lot of fanfare leaves with nothing. <clears throat> didn't, didn't get, <clears throat> didn't get the offer to join NATO. Didn't get even the, uh, a declaration, certainly not a time stamp on anything, which he wanted. Didn't get any new uh, offers of any weapons or any, or any money either. So he basically left uh, with some birthday cake and that's about it. Then he comes back to the New York for the United Nations and he wants even more, uh, <clears throat> now he wants long range missiles and more money. And basically he leaves with nothing but a bunch of additional pats on the back. So, and you already mentioned the stuff about how he had, you know, used the whole Kursk offensive to try to stir things up in, a, in the, in the media realm to try and generate some excitement, et cetera, to get it, all of that failed. So you would think, okay, maybe you wouldn't, but some people may think <laughs> that, that when he goes back home, he's going to, uh, you know, have an appetite suppressant. He's going to realize the, the, the cavalry's not coming. There's nobody going to come to rescue me. We, we better start trying to do something else. But instead, um, he seems to be going back into the, uh, to the world of, you know what, let's just, uh, let's just keep pretending like everything's okay and everything's going to be fine. And we're going to, we're just going to bring a lot of top defense countries, companies over and then talk about stuff here. Now you see that picture with all these top defense people who would love to get Western money or Ukraine money or anything else <clears throat> and are not concerned about whether this is winnable or losable. And that, that reminds you, and I don't know if Gary, if you still have it up there, if you can, Oh yeah, there it yeah, is. There. there we go. Remember that from December. I, mean, I, I wonder if those are the same people around that other table and you see how eager they were smiling here and uh, put that other one back up, Gary. Let's see that if any of those guys are still smiling. I, can't really tell from here. We got the back of their heads, but you can be sure that when the, the when he will, then they walk out of there with any kind of new contracts that uh, they're going to be happy. But uh, he's he's just completely remained detached from reality, despite all that stuff I told you on the on the political and diplomatic realms and and the absence of any kind of uh, of success. Despite all of the losses on the tactical area that we just went through and talked about, here's what he's saying right now. Here, if you can roll that tape. Today, I held meetings with the military leadership, Commander-in-Chief Sersky, Chief of the General Staff Barhilovich, on our brigade's needs on the frontline situation. We discussed the things that our partners can really enhance in the near future. There was a separate report by the Chief of the Defense Intelligence of Ukraine Budanov and Minister of Defense Umarov on how our intelligence assesses this year's prospects, Russian intentions, the tasks the Kremlin is setting for their military. We clearly see the main guidelines for what exactly needs to be responded to and in what way. 
Today, there was also a report by Prime Minister Dennis Schmeichel. Okay, yeah, that's that's good enough right there, Gary. We can run back that. So so basically, okay, I got all these dudes in here with a lot of money and actually want to make a lot of money, and we're going to like make all these cool weapons, and it's going to be great. And, and I've looked at the tactical situation. I know what's coming. I know what we need, and uh, my, my guys told me what we need, and now we got these, and so they're going to get it. Almost as though <clears throat> it's like, you know what? Uh, we're going to run to Costco. And we're going to get a bunch of bulk stuff to bring here. She should be back uh, later this afternoon. I mean, no matter what anyone thinks about what's happening on the ground, anything that's discussed at that table that there, you're talking years before it actually manifested anything on the best of circumstances. So right. nothing is coming in the near term here. And when you say you know what Rush is doing, well, I mean, you can just look at the military summary channel on open source to figure that out. You don't have to have any intelligence uh, network to figure what Rush is doing. They're pretty open about what they're doing, and they're methodically grinding you to mm -hmm. dust. So whether there's a big arrow movement coming and there's pros and cons to whether there is or isn't, but even if there isn't, the methodical version will eventually just grind them to, to dust. They, they just can't fight an attrition war, and yet you, you see no cognition of that at all. No, and I, I think um, you know that photo you showed uh, from last year. It may have been then. It may have been earlier in 2023. But Zelensky held uh, 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 the International Defense Armament something or other. I forget what the name of this thing was that he just held there in 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 in, uh, in Ukraine. And last year, when they held the first of those. Uh, the idea was that Ukraine, this is what they said, was going to be the arsenal of democracy. It was going to be the, the munitions factory of Europe. That's what he promised them. Um, at the same time, too, promising the banks, uh, the Western banks, uh, the city and, and Wall Street, that you will be able to rebuild our country. So you're talking to Danny about hundreds of billions of dollars here being flaunted in front of these people. If I was Zelensky sitting at that table that you showed, my thing to those uh, uh, defense contractors would be, you've already got tens and tens of billions of dollars in contracts that are lined up, right? And delivery won't occur for years. So if you want that money, you better keep me in power because the only way you're getting that money, the only way those contracts are being fulfilled, if I'm still in power, if I don't fall. So you better go to go and tell your congressmen that they need to do everything they can to keep this country afloat. Um, and I think that would be the play he makes and the same play he makes towards the banks as well is that you've been promised this reconstruction. People are talking hundreds of billions of dollars coming your way. You know that the only way that occurs is if we don't collapse. The only way you're going to get that money is if you keep me in power. And I think that's the play he makes. That's the pitch he's making, uh, whether he's so uh, 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 clear or, or so obvious in his wording. I think that's what's being understood. Uh, I think what happens with the Ukrainians is because we did see around July talk about negotiations and talk about, you know, uh, uh, and into August, a, a willingness to consider something other than victory. Uh, and you start hearing this from the Ukrainians themselves. And then what happens is Joe Biden drops out. And all of a sudden, the race in the United States is not a foregone conclusion. And so that puts some that puts some punch, that gives some life back to the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians thinking now, well, hey, it's not guaranteed that Trump wins. And if Harris wins, then we're still in this. Harris has been clear about that, right? And so then Zelensky, this whole victory plan, I'm going to show up, I'm going to go paint campaign for, uh, for Kamala Harris. Right. And right. You saw how well that went down. So I think what we saw also too last week with was that uh, when he shows up and he goes to that uh, artillery shell, uh, a, a manufacturing plant and with the governor Shapiro and Senator Casey and the response to that in the United States is just outrage. People are, ex unless you are vote blue, no matter who uh, blue MAGA type of, of thing, <laughs> you are upset about that. And I think, you know, so whatever plans Linsky has there now, he's getting the reg pulled out from running because when he gets down to Washington, DC, yeah, he meets with Biden, he meets with Harris, but, no one, no one's, no one's really highlighting, you know, the, the, those, uh, the photos and the videos coming out of that. Right. You know what I mean? So, um, I, I think they are trying, the Ukrainians in power are trying to hold on to their power 
because they're corrupt and they know what will happen to them if they lose. I mean, most of them will just abscond to their mansions and their villas anyway. But also, too, I think there are some who believed in the promise that was given to them by the Americans and by the Brits and by NATO back in the late winter and spring of 2022 that we are with you. We are going to help you defeat your historic enemy uh, to Zelensky. They said we are going to make you this generation's Churchill. And I think they're still holding on to that. And there's certainly some delusion. If you remember a year ago, about this time a year ago, Time Magazine had a big cover story about Vol uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, where his own staff, his own, his own inner circle was saying, this guy is delusional. He's messianic. Yep. Now, not much prior before that, a year before that, he was Time's man of the year. So we have to always be humble, right? And how quickly things can turn around. Change. But and yeah, you know, so I think, yeah. <laughs> you you look at the, where where things are right now. Uh, that headline Gary put up there a second ago is a good example of it uh, because there's it's touting that they're having this new defense industry, et cetera. Well, ab about uh, let's see, I want to say it was um, may have been June, late June, uh, early yeah, July. Yep. Yeah, there it is. Gary's always on top of that. Uh, yeah, things change a lot. Nobody believes Victor like I do, and nobody, and in fact, none of his people do either. Well, and you uh, know, Danny, there's a good there's a good article in the Financial Times yesterday. I can't remember off the top of my head the title or who wrote it, but it's a very good, it's a long article. It's it's 2,500 words or so that goes into a lot of what we're talking about here, and it goes into the dynamics. And if people I know, people are like, Financial Times is a paywall. No, what you do is you download their app and you can read this stuff on the app as long as you're on the app. So I, I, was, I was always concerned about Financial Times too. I didn't know that. I, I just learned that, you know, literally yesterday. So in order okay. to read that article, that's how I learned it. So, you know, uh, download their app and you can read their stuff. Uh, but anyway, um, this article goes into a lot of different things, but it goes into the conflict internal in Ukraine right now. One of the things it points out is that uh, at the beginning of, 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 of this war, of, of, of the war, uh, the invasion that begins in 2022, uh, almost 90 percent of Ukrainians are, are, are there will be no talks. There are no negotiations. We are going to win this. And that number is now down to about 55 percent of Ukrainians. Right. So you've seen almost a third, you know, a, a 35 uh, point drop in the number of Ukrainians who are willing to fight this thing to the end. You know, so you're, you're talking about basically a bare majority. And that number that the Financial Times cited was a poll from May. So that was there at 55 percent six months ago. Right. So now they're probably much closer to 50 percent. And we've seen this in other polling, too. That the Ukrainian public is, is willing. They, they, they see the reality. They know this is an unwinnable war. They're not really sure what the purpose of it is. They understand the history involved of it. They also understand the corruption that's around all of them. And they see their neighbors, their friends, their family getting sent off uh, uh, to get thrown into this furnace for what purposes right. to serve who? They understand all that. Yeah. The other it's side cool. of it, the, well, well, real quick, sure. the other side of the Financial Times brought up, though, is that, and they had Ukrainian officials who were saying, you know, we're talking about the end of the war here, or the end of the war here in a way that six months ago was forbidden to talk about. And, but they say the problem is, is that the far right is so powerful and they have their own militarized forces that any type of negotiation will be seen by them as betrayal. And in, a set, in essence, they, they speak about how that could lead to a coup, to a civil war, et cetera. So you, you, the dynamic within Ukraine is really becoming fractured. Whatever they had two years ago in terms of a solid basis among their, their elite, among their businesses, among their public, whoever, in terms of the way forward with thing, this thing is completely gone. And I think this is something that that any I mean, most of us who are observing this and commenting on said this is what's going to happen. You can't. You, you, you've got a corrupt government that you're trying to win an unwinnable war uh, in a war that has a context that is very, very much not a manichaean good versus evil struggle. Neither side is good here. Uh, this thing is bound to, to fall apart, come undone, you know, over time. And I think that's what we're really clearly seeing internally in ukraine yeah and 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 look i mean the, the the writing is on the wall and it's now getting in like sharpie kind of bold yeah. i mean they, they don't have enough troops to continue on with this uh he left empty-handed after the nato conference empty-handed after the u.n conference uh nobody has promised any kind of large number of, of additional 
I mean, I'm talking like in the hundreds of artillery pieces, APCs, tanks, et cetera. Danny, uh, no one's got them, right? No yeah, one's got well, them. It, because they've all, yeah, because most of them are rusting out on the battlefield yeah. after the last two and a half years. Uh, no to the long range weapons, at least from the United States. There's no real hope. And then, as if all that wasn't enough, now that you have this mess going on over in the Middle East, where Israel is now about to expand its war against Iran, and it has already expanded its war against Hezbollah in the southern part of Lebanon, and that's starting to chew them up immediately. They immediately are having some bad results there, but that is going to send through the roof their ammunition requirements in right. many of the same categories that Ukraine is desperately begging for. And I assure you, those are now going to be highly prioritized in Israel. So right. you, you, think, you, think the Ukrainians are gonna, you think the Ukrainians are going to get any Patriot missiles anytime soon? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? Because, man, especially after that uh, that strike the other night by uh, Iran, uh, Israel or Iran, and then uh, Israel yeah. is certainly going to strike back. But the, I, I saw one report early this morning that uh, the uh, the Israeli side in in all of their whether it's Iron Dome, it's the the uh, the David Sling or, or the other one, I can't remember the the, the arrow, the arrow. arrow system. Yeah, all, all that combined, they used up about a year's worth of of interceptor missile production. Yeah. Oh yeah. One year. Just yeah. when that huge barrage there, and Iran has a lot more of those, and then where it came from, a lot more than two. They can they can fire. I, I've I heard from an expert earlier today that said they have the capacity. If they went on a like a, a full on war, they could launch waves of hundred of 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 these missiles. And there's just not enough interceptor missiles there, so they're all going to Israel right now. Well, and then too, you have to factor in, and this is one of the reasons. I mean, multiple reasons why I think Iran uh, carried out those strikes yesterday. Uh, one of them being is that the, 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 the value, the utility, the strength of the axis of resistance is in its membership. And so it's seen, it's seen uh, Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad get degraded over the course of a year of the genocide in Gaza to the point that they probably aren't going to be able to throw too much at Israel. Uh, and now that is taking place in Lebanon where Israel wants to degrade Hezbollah. And so if you're Iran and you're seeing your allies getting degraded like this, you can't let that happen. You know, otherwise you're going to be left standing alone because after Hezbollah, then they'll move on to Syria or they move on to Yemen, right? You can't let them take you apart piecemeal. So I think that was part of uh, Iran's warning yesterday for them, why they wanted them to back off, even though the risks entailed of like, are we walking into Netanyahu and Israel's trap here? Are we taking their bait by giving them the response that they want to justify to the Americans that we have to come in? And of course, you have seen across the political media landscape in the U.S., a full-throated support for the U.S. doing whatever it needs to do, wants to do in the Middle East. Which right, is right, right. But here, here's, here's the point that I want to make. So the, here's a clip from about two weeks ago of Jake Sullivan uh, in Kiev. Now, this is before all the explosions in the Middle East in terms of, you know, this missile stuff. Watch what he says here about interceptor missiles. Ukraine was running short of air defense interceptors. So I sat down with my team and I said, where are we sending Patriot missiles and AMRAM missiles around the world in the next 12 months? And I was told there's a whole list of countries we're sending them to. And I said, take every single one of those missiles, every one, and send them to Ukraine. That was not an easy thing to do. It required us to get our allies and partners to come along. Frankly, it required our bureaucracy to come along. And we are currently working on a substantial package, pulling together a range of different capabilities that we are going to try to get out the door before the end of this month. Okay, and and now what? Now that you see that Israel is is dying for these same interceptor missiles, what you're going to do? This is you've already robbed Peter. You saw hurt him. He robbed Peter of all these other people that we have have promised these missiles to to give them to Paul or uh, Vladimir in this case. Now is he going to rob them from Vladimir and give them over to Bibi Netanyahu? I mean, right. you see where this is going. You don't have them, so you're going to have to take them from somewhere or you're just not gonna have them in the air when you need them, and then neither side is gonna have them. And your point about how quickly can you make these things is so key, Danny. I think people don't understand how long it takes to build these missiles, right? I mean, and the fact that to build another plant 
to build these missiles and get the workforce and train them to build these missiles yep. is going to take years. And I was trying years. to look up real quick the production rate for the Patriot in the United States for the, for the interceptors. And it's only a couple dozen a month, I think. And what I did find is I remember is that last month or two months ago, Japan agreed to increase their Patriot missile production. And this is a big, big hoopla and defense news reporter that, oh, the Japanese are coming in. They're going to save the day. They're going to, you know, they're going to build more Patriot interceptors. And then you read the details and Japan is going to increase their production from 60 a year to 100 a year, which, as you said, that that's an how what maybe a couple hours worth, uh, you know, at that point. You know, I mean, like yeah. if that if that I mean, certainly. uh how many how many interceptors were fired last night or yesterday by Israel? Hundreds, yeah, and, hundreds, and that's hundreds. on that's on two hundred ballistic missiles. Yeah. Now imagine if it's if they're going to actually intend to hurt something and it comes in like four or five hundred drones first, and right. you have to have interceptors to shoot all those down. You can't let them go through because of of the ammunition. Even though they're easy to shoot down, you still have to use an interceptor to shoot it down. And then they follow up with a couple of waves of, of two or three hundred of the of the ballistic missiles here. And you can see that you're going to run out in no time at all. Yeah. And of course, in a, and of course, you got to add in Iran's allies. So what can the Yemenis throw at this? We've seen what the Yemenis have done consistently even though they're getting uh, supposedly pounded by the American and British, uh, you know, Air Force and navies, uh, you know, strike after strike, the largest naval battle since World War II, and the Yemenis haven't missed a step, right? So how much could Ye Yemen, and they've shown this, they've demonstrated they can do this. They, they sh they've, they've sent a, a few drones and a few ballistic missiles to Israel, essentially, I believe, as a warning to let them know we can do this. Uh, and the same thing, of course, uh, the, the uh, uh, Islamic resistance in Iraq and others, uh, they don't they may not have the ballistic missiles like the Iranians or the Yemenis or the Hezbollah has. They certainly have a ton of drones. So you put this all together and we've still not seen, uh, you know, what Hezbollah will do. Uh, you know, they have been firing missiles, uh, but primarily Katusha type unguided uh, uh, shorter range rockets over the last week into Israel. But if they have the capacity to utilize all these ballistic missiles they supposedly have tied in with Iran, tied in with Yemen, and then the Iraqis and the Syrians kick in what they can with their drones. And then, of course, Hamas, Hamas uh, and PIJ are firing rockets out of Gaza because they still can do that. Not a lot, but they can still can do it. Yeah, you're going to have a really t terrible night, a really terrible week, a really terrible month, however long they want to extend that to for Israel, because at some point they're going to run out of inventory of interceptors. And it's not yeah. a question of just, you know, the United States will fund it. We'll just we'll just put your don't worry, Israel, like we've did with the Iraq war, the Afghan war, everything else. We'll just put it on the credit card. We're not you know, we don't even care about it. No, you can't build the things. It's just yeah. that simple. So the, then then we'll have the the threat or the risk, rather, the temptation to take them out of our wartime stock right. yeah. because we do have them. But then, then we make we literally put our national security at risk, and I bet there's some that are willing to think about that. But anyway, we'll see. We'll see where that goes. Listen, I say, um, it reminds me we have so much here still, like in the sense of the number of batteries that Patriot batteries batteries we have sent to Ukraine. I think is less than ten. And meanwhile, we have at least a hundred batteries here in the United States. It's the same with the tanks, with the Abrams tanks. We 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 rebuilt or whatever we did to send them forty uh, M one A ones. Uh, and meantime, the Marine Corps just retired 250 or so M1A2s. Uh, they're all sitting out in Barstow, California, probably. Why didn't we give them that? And I'm reminded of a, of a Louis C.K. bit where he talks about how he tells his little girls there's no ice cream in the refrigerator. Uh, and the reality is that the freezer is stocked with ice cream, but they're not tall enough to see into it, you know, kind of thing. And he talks about like their heartbreak, how this made, how this will ruin their, his relationship with them for life. And that's how the Ukrainians should be. You guys are telling us you can't give us the stuff and it's all sitting there. All those M1 tanks are sitting in California or in Georgia or wherever we, the Marine Corps stored them. You know, why well, don't you well, The issue with the, with the Patriots, though, is that they, we may have the batteries, but we don't have the interceptors. We don't have, exactly. That's, that's, that's a big the point. problem with yeah. that. Yeah.